Welcome everybody to the afternoon session of BC Links to Learning. Thank you for joining us. I hope you guys are finding the app to be very helpful. I think it's a very, very cool app. It's you're able to engage with others that are also attending. So please do so in the community. And uh, Hillary, I'll let you take it away. Super, thank you so much for inviting me today. And I just wanna acknowledge that I'm joining you today from the uh, uh, traditional territory of the unceded Algonquin Nation uh, in the Ottawa region. So um, it's a great pleasure to join everybody here. And I also just wanted to say that um, for the purpose of today's discussion, um, I my, my plan is actually just to highlight the work at the Canada Infrastructure Bank and my background um, and some of the new initiatives that we're undertaking at the Canada Infrastructure Bank, including the Indigenous Community Infrastructure Initiative. Um, which will see us making investments in uh, community-based infrastructure. So infrastructure that's going to help close the gap in uh, First Nations, Métis and Inuit communities across Canada from coast to coast to coast. Um, so I, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. And, you know, I'd love to have, um, you know, any of you uh, pose any questions and we can have a discussion. Um, if you're uh, one to speak live, I think that that's available to all of you. Um, but also in the chat, I will put um, I'll put my a, a generic email address and I'll also give you my own email address. So if you did have any questions or you wanted to follow up with a discussion about a specific uh, project that you may be working on or that your community may be working on, I'm happy to have a more in depth conversation as well if this isn't the right forum for that. So by way of background, my name is Hilary Thatcher. Um, I was born and bred in, uh, you know, the GTA region of Southern Ontario. I'm Métis though from Alberta and, um, you know, my background really has been predominantly with the public service. So I, um, you know, I went to grad school out at UVic in Indigenous Governance and then I uh, immediately came to the province of Ontario as a land claim negotiator. And, and after spending about uh, 20 years with the province of Ontario, I I uh, joined the federal family um, as the head of innovation for Indigenous Services Canada for a very short stint before leaving about a year ago to join the Canada Infrastructure Bank. And my goal at the Canada Infrastructure Bank was really about understanding their mandate on reconciliation and making sure and contributing to a really deliberate and purposeful um, uh, dialogue at the Canada Infrastructure Bank about Indigenous inclusion in infrastructure. And so when we think about Indigenous inclusion in, in infrastructure at the Canada Infrastructure Bank initially, um, and predominantly, the focus was on very large scale infrastructure where the Canada Infrastructure Bank was making investments. So these are large scale transmission lines, um, you know, large highways, toll bridges, that type of stuff. Um, our minimum investment was always said to be uh, $100 million. And so what the gap that it wasn't addressing was the smaller community based infrastructure needs. Um, nonetheless, in our large projects, we did and have and continue to develop a lot of projects where there's Indigenous communities um, either driving the project, as is the case of the Kabalik uh, uh, transmission line, it's a, uh, the hydro fibre line, which will bring uh, transmission and clean power along with uh, fibre connectivity up to Nunavut, it will be the first land-based connection to Nunavut. Um, and that's being driven by Inuit specifically. But we're also working on other large projects that are including Indigenous participation in the equity box where Indigenous communities are partnering with developers. And we recently announced, for example, the Oneida Battery Park. And so that's a large project, battery storage in southwestern Ontario, which will actually have um, Six Nations of the Grand River as an owner of that project. So we continue to think about Indigenous inclusion on the large projects. But most recently, we um, launched our Indigenous Community Infrastructure Initiative. And the goal of this project really has been to close the infrastructure gap that we all know so many First Nations, Métis and Inuit communities face in our core infrastructure. And so the program which I'll describe to you is, is the new program that was launched on March 19th. We launched it actually at the First Nation Major Projects Coalition. And what it does is it allows us to invest smaller amounts um, of capital into projects. What we don't do is we don't have grant programs. So we make investments in projects. So we're looking at projects that have the potential to be revenue generating. And so our investments can be as low as $5 million and up to $50 million. 
and we can invest with um, very patient capital, so for the life of the asset. And we look to the, the, the project specifically to see whether or not and how it can generate revenue, whether it's from user fees or from um, other service uh, fees or um, uh, tolls. We've got you know, some really interesting options um, to look at how to generate some revenues from, from the infrastructure. The bank also has a limited mandate, so we can only invest in so many types of infrastructure. And so I know that I've had a number of requests for building um, housing, uh, healthcare facilities, schools. Um, unfortunately, that's considered social infrastructure, and the bank that is, doesn't have that included in its mandate. And the federal government created our mandate um, very purposefully so that we're not tripping up over other agencies that provide um, funding or uh, investments in those types of infrastructure. So what we can invest in is uh, clean power. So anything that's going to help community get off diesel generation or to stabilize its own current energy um, uh, security. And we do know a number of communities that are sort of at the end of a transmission line where they suffer a you know, number of brownouts and, and blackouts during storms. And so really trying to stabilize and create that energy security for communities. Um, we can invest in green infrastructure, which would include things like uh, deep energy retrofits of band owned buildings um, or water and wastewater are, are, is another uh, potential avenue. We can invest in broadband and connectivity for communities. So we can, uh, that's a large part of our portfolio. And we work really closely with ICID, for example, on the UBF fund that was, uh, you know, closed in, in March. But we're working very closely with the federal government to, to maximize the number of households that are connected across Canada. We can invest in trade and transport. And so we've seen a number of projects that have come in around, um, ports, marinas, um, northern airports in particular are, are quite of an interest. We've also got some rail projects where communities are owners and it's, it's providing access to communities. Um, and we, we know of a number of winter road networks that are looking for investment. And then the last area is public transit. And so um, we launched a, a zero emission buses uh, initiative last fall. Um, I haven't had any indigenous populations uh, in Canada right now approach us on any of the uh, uh, public transit projects that they're interested in working on. Um, they tend to be more urban in nature, but you know we are able to make investments uh, in this smaller range to help support those community projects. So effectively, um, you know the way that our, our intake works right now is we like to get involved and work with communities at the earliest stage possible. Um, quite often what happens is a community or a community development corporation will reach out to the bank to begin discussions about their projects. Um, we will look to see if the CIB can offer a financing solution. Our goal is not to crowd out other private sector funders. Um, and, you know, we're very familiar with the work of the First Nation Financing Authority and other banks and, and uh, sustainable investment funds that are looking at making investments in Indigenous communities. So we really want to help to de-risk uh, other investors. We want to help um, Indigenous communities where they may be making their own investments in the equity box of the projects. And really our goal is ultimately to close the infrastructure gap and to support the federal government in its very ambitious mandate to close that gap uh, and accelerate closing the gap by 2030. And we know that the gap is uh, large across communities across Canada and so really our um, our goal is just to make sure that we can uh, play a role in helping to accelerate uh, closing that gap. Um, the other piece that I think is important to note is that you know often communities find and uh, especially in the infrastructure space whether they're Indigenous communities or non-Indigenous communities that with federal grants, there's stacking rules around whether or not you can stack a CIB investment with a federal grant. And in the case of Indigenous infrastructure and the initiative that the Canada Infrastructure Bank uh, is moving forward or has been moving forward, um, we're not finding uh, stacking to be an issue for, for these projects. In fact, what we're finding is that the departments across Canada, um, across the federal family, are looking to the bank to figure out how we can make the grants go a bit further and bring in some debt financing at an affordable rate to make the projects economic. And so it may not be um, 
you know, an option for every project. Some projects are definitely going to rely more heavily on grants, but other projects may actually have a, a stable revenue stream that they could actually debt finance. And as we all know, um, debt financing can be challenging for, you know, uh, many communities, um, Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities, but we know that debt financing can be challenging. Um, risk profiles are often misunderstood by the large financial institutions. And um, you know the CIB can help to you know create that space where uh, communities can access affordable capital with uh, you know a lot of flexibility. The final piece I'll say is that um, you know I mentioned about revenue streams coming from the projects um, under the Indigenous Community Infrastructure Initiative at the CIB. We can also look at alternative revenue sources, and so we've had we've been approached by a number of communities now where. They know that the revenues from the, the infrastructure itself may not be enough to cover the debts over a long period. And so they would like to um, look at other revenue sources that their community has either through, um, through typically through other businesses that have been quite successful for the community. And so we're able to look at that. We have a lot of flexibility around the revenue stream in order to pay off the debt. And so that's, um, you know, I think a pretty key point because it's it's not a flexibility we typically have at the bank. Um, the bank does uh, typically rely on the revenues from the projects. And so under the Indigenous Initiative, recognizing that revenue streams um, may not be enough, we've um, been able to incorporate some additional flexibilities. I think the goal and certainly um, for CIB is to not draw too many lines in the sand to make sure that we have enough flexibility that we can work with the communities um, to move their projects forward. And as I also mentioned, you know, we like to begin our discussions with communities at an early stage so we can help them to think about how to structure a project, uh, the project financing. We can also bring in um, different federal partners, um, work with the province or territories as well to make sure that we can, you know, we're all working on the same page, thinking about how to accelerate projects um, and support the project's uh, financial needs as well. So, um, yeah, we have, a, we have quite a bit of flexibility. We have uh, good relationships with, with provincial and uh, territorial and the federal government. Um, and, you know, once we have those discussions, you know, typically what we do is we move to um, a project appraisal memo within the bank. Um, we assess the project. We make sure that it's in mandate within the Indigenous Community Infrastructure Initiative. And once we get that, we can begin negotiations with the community and the project um, on an MOU and term sheet so that we can come to some agreement as to how we would structure uh, the financing of the project. Um, and once we're all comfortable there, we get that approved by our board of directors, which is independent from the federal government, but um, you know, as the bank is a crown corporation. And then we, you know, work with the community to figure timelines and work quick schedule to get um, our uh, to get our the projects fully funded and through a final investment memo. And so, you know, it's really important, I think, that we think from work back schedules to when the project is needed, when the when we think we can get financing in place so that we can put in place certain metrics and streams of work so that we can meet the community's timelines and um, their aspirations for the project. So I think uh, with that, I wanted to open up to any questions and I see that the chat is um, pretty quiet right now. And I'm happy to, um, and maybe uh, Breezy, I don't know if, is it possible that uh, folks can be unmuted if they wanted to ask a question with their voice instead of writing something in the chat? I believe they would be able to unmute themselves uh, Dave, would they have that capability to do that on their own? Yeah, absolutely. They just have to unmute and yeah, and then they should be okay to just ask the question. Yeah. Yep. And I'm I'm also going to put in the chat as I promised earlier. I'm going to put in my email address so that if you do have any questions with a specific project, um, that you can always email me directly. And um, and we have another one. Looks like you have a question from Tony. Super. Go ahead, Tony. Hi, I was just wondering if there's a difference, like if this option is still open for nations that are like within self-governance or um, if it's not covered under self-government. Absolutely. So the goal of the project is to support any First Nation, Métis or Inuit community. 
um, or self-government uh, community and so that we can help close the infrastructure gap facing Indigenous populations. So um, it's, uh, it, it, we're agnostic. Um, we're also, you know, very concerned, um, you know, with, uh, you know, and being Métis, certainly it's, it's one of those pieces where we're often a part of a larger, often rural community. And so we, um, you know, it's hard, it's a bit more challenging to define where our community is. And so we're certainly working with the Métis Nation to think about how to be flexible around our arrangements to make sure that Métis citizens are also getting the services they need. And certainly when you live in more northern and rural communities, it can be quite challenging. So um, absolutely um, self-governing communities are, are, uh, are eligible. Uh, Jason, I think you have another question. Oops, I can't hear Jason. Can you unmute yourself, yeah. Jason, there? Yeah, it looks like he's unmuted, but for some reason his uh, actual yeah. microphone's not connected properly. Oh. Um, worst case, maybe, Jason, you could type it into the chat. If, we if you're your talking about Jason Peters, I did not have a question. <laughs> Oh, Jason, Jason Scott. Scott. Oh, Jason. Okay, Sorry, there you go. Okay, let's just see here. Here we go. Can you see that, Hillary? Do you want me to read it out for you? Yeah, so he's looking for the return on investment. So we don't actually have a minimum return on investment. Um, you know, we um, we want to work with the nation to figure out what the waterfall would be. Um, and certainly, you know, we're some of these projects are going to have very uh, probably fairly minimal return on investment, particularly after paying off its the debt to the project. And so we're not, um, you know, the bank itself ha can offer very low interest rates, we can go as low as 1%. Um, and that's really covering the cost of capital for us. So we're not, um, we're, we're, um, we're an alternative solution to communities. If, if a private lender can come in and the project can afford, um, you know, higher rates, then we're, we are not needed. And so we're not trying to crowd out the private capital. But really, what we're, we're looking at is, you know, trying to get projects um, up and running, and that's why we can go as low as as one percent. So we'll look at the project at, on its on its whole as through its, all of its merits and figure out what's um, you know reasonable. Um, but you know, I think many of these projects, as you can appreciate, aren't going to be seeing high rates of uh, uh, of interest from the CIB. We do hope that you know you know from um, from a you know an investment for the community that they'll they'll see some revenue flow from the project as well as an equity investor in their own project so um but we're not you know we're not um we're we're being very flexible and we need to be flexible to make sure that uh, these projects can take on some debt because it's challenging for so many of these types of projects um i also see a question from wendy can you use future taxation revenues to help support new infrastructure debt? Um, Wendy, this is a really good question, and um, you know we our goal is not to increase tax burden, um, but you know in the case of I, I'll give you an example. So on a water wastewater project, there's often user fees um, that folks loathe to call taxes, but others will say that they are taxes. So I'm and I'm happy to have you talk to me a little bit more to unpack the question, but um, you know, if taxation is the way that the community is um, generating enough revenue and they can apply that back to um, you know, an infrastructure project, absolutely we would look at that as a revenue source to pay the debt. And so you know, I'm thinking about a particular water project I'm working on right now where you know, there's on the reserve, there's actually a, a very large cottage um, rental leased land and so while they don't call it taxation, they call it service fees. Um, and so those service fees are applied to, um, are, are gonna be applied to the, uh, to the debt on the project, or at least under the nominal and uh, notional structure. But um, you know, we're, we're happy to work and be very creative with the community if they, ha if they have access to tax revenues. Um, 
then certainly, you know, that that would be a, a revenue stream that we would certainly consider to help pay pay the debt. Um, so, Corey, I'm just going to read your question regarding project eligibility for trade and green infrastructure. CIB mentions return on investment. Can this be an indirect return on investment? For instance, we're reviewing a commercial development, but are searching for financial tools and lending for roads and water, wastewater infrastructure. So I'm trying to, I wanna make sure I understand the question properly. Yeah, and I, th and I think maybe Hillary, just to elaborate on that a little bit, you may have yeah. answered part of that question um, in terms of defining um, a return on investment, uh, such as property taxation that's that's created from those um, site improvements. Um, for the Kulit First Nation, we're currently looking at a, a residential and commercial development um, partnership. And as part of that partnership, we would be expected to bring forward um, capital for uh, infrastructure such as roadways, water servicing, and uh, some wastewater management um, infrastructure. And uh, I'm just curious if that's if that's something um, CIB would consider. That'd be so, a project. So it's possible. Now, is this particular project going to be um, for um, members of the First Nation, or is it just a, it, or, or is it part of the reserve, or is it part of the, the like just a, a you know in Eucalyptus uh, an expansion for like a, a new subdivision or something like that? Um, yeah, so it's, it's since 2011, um, treat, final, finalized the treaty, um, yep. the Malnu Treaty, and uh, we have uh, tr title to treaty settlement lands. So these would be within treaty settlement lands, and we'd okay. be looking to unlock those, the value of those with uh, pre-selling some 99-year leases prepaid. Okay. Um, developers would bring forward, you know, their specialization and their own capital and cash flows to manage all the construction activity. And we would be bringing in uh, the capital to finance the, the infrastructure that supports that um, and benefiting as the, as the property tax uh, base from the land. Yeah, I think, you know, I, we, we could have a, a bit more detailed discussion about it, but I certainly think that it, um, you know, at first blush, um, would, would certainly suit the a CIB investment. We're really trying to help um, the communities move the infrastructure, their infrastructure projects forward and recognize also that, you know, it's not, it's not every community is able to access um, a traditional lender um, mm -hmm. to access capital and to access affordable capital as well. And so, um, yeah, at first blush, I think this sounds, you know, we're, we're looking at a couple of other projects and certainly we've been approached on, you know, urban reserves and a community of community relocation so similar types of needs in terms of the underlying infrastructure to service the 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 lands that mm -hmm. are, are going to be developed where we can't um, participate is in the actual building of housing or um, commercial buildings but um, certainly happy to have, you know have a more detailed discussion at, at a later date and I as I said I put my name my email address and uh, and contact information in the in the chat so you can always uh, send me a direct link if you want to Okay, I will follow up. Yeah, thank you very much, Hillary. Perfect. I see Crystal uh, has also asked a question. Crystal Jeanvier Roman, um, do you have grants for Indigenous entrepreneurs or loans? So it is actually a, a gap at the bank. We do not fill. We don't have any grant programs. Um, and so we lend directly to projects. And so how that typically works is we would lend into an SPB uh, that is, you know, responsible for the for the asset, the project, the infrastructure asset. And so we do this for a couple of reasons. One is because we're non recourse to the community. So if something happens to the asset, um, the debt can't be paid, it doesn't fall back to the community to, to, to fix it, um, you know, or to to come in. And so we're non recourse to the community. Um, but also we don't have grants available and that's quite deliberate um, because the federal government has a whole host of granting programs. And so when they created the infrastructure bank, they um, uh, actually did not enable us um, through our T's and C's to actually do any grant programs. Um, and we typically don't lend directly to an entrepreneur. We lend to a project. So um, 
uh, it's really about that piece of infrastructure being built. Um, and so I hope that answers your question. Probably not how you'd like it to be answered, but it's uh, as direct as I can be. Uh, Jenny Tushi asks, can you elaborate on the initiative for green infrastructure regarding extent scale of retrofits? For example, exploring green ideas for existing government housing and what is the process for securing low interest rates? So for um, energy retrofits, you know, typically we're looking at um, uh, GHG reductions as another part of the um, another part of the outcomes that we'd like to see. So we're really trying to figure out how with um, both, you know, for provinces, municipalities, and indigenous populations, how we can help reduce greenhouse gas emissions through energy retrofits. Now, the challenge is always meeting that minimum threshold of $5 million for our, our investments. But with energy retrofits, we can look at banned owned buildings. Um, and so we've actually been approached on a couple of arenas where the retrofits are pretty significant, includes new roofs, new heating, cooling systems, and you know, um, new windows and by the time new insulation. So by the time you get to that on a, on a large building like a, a, an arena, it's pretty significant cost. Like it's well over the, the five million dollar mark, just under ten, but over five. And so when you think about um, band owned buildings, including some of the uh, multi unit residents and things like that, um, you know, it, it's surprising how quickly these costs can add up. There's a couple of avenues that we have for um, so securing a low interest rate, we'll look at the project economics, you know, with energy retrofits, typically you're looking at 1% interest rate because that's, um, um, that's what's going to make the project viable. We are looking also and we take revenue risks on the payback structure so we can look at on retrofit some alternative revenue streams, including um, looking at the cost savings of the retrofit. So by doing these retrofits, it should reduce the energy consumption and the energy bills, and therefore we can take a risk on that delta between what uh, the household typically pays and after, or, or the building typically pays with what it will pay after the retrofit is done. So that's how you create the payback structure. And so we have, a, you know, you know, a lender technical advisor to actually do an upfront audit uh, so that we can understand you know what kind of measures are going to get us those savings and if we don't feel that there's going to be enough savings to actually pay back the debt then we can work with the community on looking at other um other uh, means of paying back the debt and in one case um you know the the community has rents that are generated from uh fully paid capital buildings and so you know they're going to apply a portion of their rents to also pay back but usually if you're looking at that energy savings that's you know, it should be enough um, and significant enough to help pay back the um, the the cost of the of the retrofit or the the capital costs of that. Um, and so, the extent and the scale of the retrofit will sort of all be dependent. You know, the um, you know because you want to make sure that you have that payback structure in place so that you actually get your maximum GHG savings and the maximum savings on the energy cost to that building. And so, um, that's that's certainly one way. Um, of doing it, and that's why we 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 at our cost employ an energy auditor to come in and actually do the initial sets of audits to figure out what's kind of you know what how deep do these retrofits need to go in order to maximize your um, available revenues from the uh, energy savings. Now I'm just uh, I want to be mindful of everybody's time. It's five fifteen, so we still have time. Um, available if anybody has any other questions. The other thing I'll mention is that I do have a, um, and actually it's in the process of being finalized at the bank, um, just a, a, a high level overview deck. So if you're interested in send in my sending you that, that to you, um, it should be available by the end of this week. And I was doing it for another, um, another um, promotional piece. And so I'm happy to send that to anybody. So send me an email and I'll send you our deck. Um, and then the other piece is that um, we do have on our website um, uh, an intake form. And so the intake form that's on our website really gets into a level of detail about the project. This, If your project was a shovel ready project, you know, the level of detail on our intake form would, you'd be able to answer most of the questions. What I want to say is you don't have to be able to answer all those questions, but that gives you a sense of like, if you were able to answer all those questions, your project is probably shovel ready. And that means that we can 
you know, begin negotiating some terms and conditions on, on a CIB investment. If it's not there, then we can help to, you know, direct you into how you would finish and, and complete that uh, intake form. And um, we would obviously be happy to, you know, help support uh, any community that's, uh, that's looking at uh, a, a potential CIB investment as well. So I just wanted to mention that, um, you know, the project intake form looks like it's asking for a lot of details and your project, you may not have access to all that information at this time, um, but it does, um, you know, it gives you a sense of what, you know, what we think is a, a, you know, a project that's getting close to being shovel ready in terms of it's, uh, it's just really looking at, um, you know, the, it's final financing options. Um, yeah, I think uh, the other thing on our website, you'll see our growth plan. So it actually outlines sort of the mandate of the areas of investments that the CIB can make, um, as I mentioned, in the five asset classes. Um, so that's if you're looking for, you know, if you forgot or you didn't take notes, you can certainly look on our website and you can look at our growth plan. Um, and that, that will give you some guidance in terms of whether or not uh, your project fits within mandate. And if it's sort of within one of those asset classes, but it's not spelled out, certainly reach out to us and uh, you know, we can work with you to figure out whether or not we can um, you know, include this and in, in, uh, you know, we can do an appraisal of the project to see whether or not it's something that we can make an investment in. Um, and there's, you know, other good information on the CIB website, just in terms of you'll see some of the more recent announcement of some of the projects that we've invested in um, and some, you know, some good links there so that you can kind of see, um, you know, how we are, how in, in some of the larger projects, we really are driving uh, uh, market participants and developers and provinces and territories and municipalities to consider Indigenous uh, equity and to consider a meaningful participation of, of First Nations, Métis, Inuit communities, wherever the project's located. And so, you know, it's something the bank is pretty seized with is trying to make sure that um, any, um, any uh, potential projects that come through the bank, that we're asking the right questions to make sure that, um, you know, participants or, or, you know, developers looking at a CIB investment in their larger projects are thinking about not just the duty to consult and you know requirements under UNDRIP, but also you know how could an indigenous community a local indigenous community whose traditional territory the project might fall uh be involved in the project and and there again we can come up with some pretty creative financial structures to help support uh, the indigenous community and the project to um, move forward which would enable the indigenous community to access equity um, Right now, we don't have any equity uh, loan programs, but it's certainly something that's been highlighted of late. Uh, the First Nation Major Projects Coalition had flagged uh, that the CIB, the Canada Infrastructure Bank, would be a natural place to offer equity loans uh, directly to communities. And so it's cert certainly something that we're uh, aware of and, uh, and looking to see whether or not it's um, uh, you know, something that we can do. And uh, again, it would expand our mandate and we would definitely require our shareholder, the federal government to approve that, but uh, certainly, uh, you know, worth uh, the effort to move, um, you know, those discussions forward within the federal, uh, the federal family, uh, recognizing that so many First Nations, Métis and Inuit are looking at uh, equity and they have opportunities for equity investment as well, that uh, um, it can be very challenging to borrow equity for a project. I'm just wondering if there, anybody has any further questions for me. I know there were a number of latecomers to the uh, session. And so I just wanted to highlight again that at the very top of the chat, I've, I've left my uh, personal email address as well as our more generic email address in order that if anybody has any questions or wants to have, you know, talk about a specific project or, or asset, um, that they're looking at or that their community is considering, um, you know, we can have a more, a deeper discussion, a deeper dive on specific projects. And so um, I, I uh, you know, would encourage you to make sure, uh, don't be shy, uh, reach out anytime and uh, we're happy to, to have a discussion. I see Tony's hand is up. Is, did you have another question, Tony? Yeah, um, you mentioned that uh, you, there was information on a website and things like that, and that you also had um, another presentation 
would you be able to post those things into the chat as well? Just so that if we want to go and look up more information. Sure. I can post our website. I can't post my presentation yet. I'm just fin finishing it. And so it'll be ready by the end of the week. But if Perfect. you send me an email, then I would be happy to send it directly to you. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Let me post my... I'm just gonna double check our my own website to make sure I get you the right link. Um, Cause sometimes some of these websites can be confusing. All right, so everyone good then? Any more questions that we can discuss here? Doesn't look like it. All right. Well, and, and as well, Hillary, if you want to, you could send your presentation over to uh, Svetlana at the end of the week as well. Um, and she might even be able to post it on the Links to Learning website on CanDo if it doesn't okay. make it onto the app. Because um, most of the presentations and recordings from all of the sessions will be eventually posted onto the HOVA app um, with BC Links. But again, if it, if it does take some time, it, we can always post it to the BC Links to Learning on our website as well if you send it over to Svetlana okay I can do that I'll, I'll do that by the end of this week so that it'll That's be wonderful. available to her absolutely all right so if there isn't any other questions and uh thank you so much everyone for coming make sure that you go on to that app and uh, engage with some of the other participants uh, you do the more you engage the more presence you have the more entries you get into a draw so make sure you do that as well, just go in to do the, the surveys as well, because then you can take a survey um, and get some feedback on any of the sessions that you have attended. And uh, other than that, I think if you if you want to stay on for a little while longer, if Hillary, if you want to ask Hillary any more questions, or you can leave and go back to the agenda, go back to the next session. There's one more session. I think we have a little short break right now, and then we have another one more session after that after this as well. Perfect. And I'm happy to stay on if there are any other questions that you want to ask directly. I know we have a few minutes left. Sounds good. Pretty quiet out there. <laughs> it, it is. That's okay. Yeah, no, that's okay. It means you did a nice, well rounded presentation. My brain started uh, running a mile a minute when you said green energy, and I was just going through all of the thoughts that I had with that. And I'm just trying to remember other than green energy, what were some of the other pieces that you said that they could help with? Because I think there's so, two other sorry. options you had. Yeah, so we can do, um, we call it clean power. So that's, you know, the off diesel and energy security needs of a community. So that can be anything from wind, solar, hydro, microgrids, battery storage. Um, then we can also do uh, green infrastructure. And so under green infrastructure, we're typically, you know, water, wastewater, um, and energy retrofits. Um, we can also do broadband. And so a lot of communities, you know, depending on where they're located, have, you know, don't have the, you know, very good capacity with broadband if you're more rural. Um, actually, even in southern Ontario, a lot of communities don't have very good broadband access. And so it's really about um, making sure more households are connected and stabilizing the uh, current broadband. And then trade and transport is another area. So that's like marinas, ports, airports, um, you know, roads, bridges, that kind of thing. 
So, okay. So would you work with then with the province? Cause I know a lot of first nations actually have um, the main roads going through their nations are usually covered under provincial guidelines or whatever. Right. So when you're working on upgrading roads and bridges, would, would that be something that you need to work with the province with, or would that be something that the nation could actually cover? It's actually a really good question, Tony. So there's um, a couple of, so I'll give you some examples of a few projects I'm working on right now. So one is a bridge to a community. So the community's driving that project, but it comes from, and it's the community's like based on an island and there's real issues with access during the freeze and the thaw. Um, so there's issues around this particular um, community because of climate change. And so they're really driving the project, but they're working with the province because they need to have provincial approvals along the way. And so the, they're working really closely with the province. Um, in other cases, we've got a major highway going through Northern Ontario, Northwestern Ontario, where the community is actually driving the project. Um, at this point, we're not sure if the bank's gonna get involved in it, but we've been brought in to sort of assess the project in particular because the First Nation is driving the project, but it's a provincial highway. And so the province in that case is very supportive of the First Nations driving that project. And so it's also for that for that particular portion of the highway, it's really about safety and security of, of residents. And also they're considering doing some tolls, um, but they want to protect their residents so that the, the First Nations aren't going to be told, but they would be tolling, you know, more of the commercial traffic. And so, um, you know, they're looking at alternatives and really creative structures. Um, I'm not sure, again, if that project will go forward to the bank, but they're looking at a lot of creative structures, but typically you see the, the communities working with the province, but it doesn't mean that they can't drive a project that's needed in their region and in their territory, especially when it comes to access to the communities. And, and so many communities are on, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, my early days in my career and being in Northern BC, where you see communities off like these logging roads and, you know, not, um, you know, transportation routes and, uh, you know, Northern Ontario and Northern Manitoba, where you're like reliant on these winter roads, and then there's not a whole lot in the in the off seasons. And so um, community and with climate change, it's really impacting the, the access for communities. So communities can certainly drive the projects. I think uh, working with the provincial sponsor is important. It'd be like building a transmission line. Um, it probably wouldn't happen unless Hydro, uh, BC Hydro was supportive of it. Um, but there certainly is openness for more um, you know, economic development, but also for, uh, you know, meaningful participation of uh, First Nations. Thank you. I, I have one more piece. I don't want to take up everybody's spot if anyone else has a question to ask. I don't see any other hand, so please go right ahead. You mentioned water. So is that just upgrading from the current water systems that a nation has, or is that, could you change completely the type of system that they're, that they're using to a different system? Like what, what are the yeah. options? So for us, we're not developers. We're looking to help support the community. So it's whatever works best for the community. And so uh, in some cases, the community will be doing an expansion of their current water system. Um, and that requires significant amount of capital. In other cases, the water system needs to be completely replaced. And so I think it'll be up to the community and their consultants and their advisors as to what's the best option for the community. And, you know, given my previous experience uh, working with uh, predominantly First Nations in Ontario, you know, we've seen where systems were built that weren't the right systems for the community. And so they really need to replace the whole thing. Um, or it's at end of life and again, significant um, replacement and refurbishment is needed. And sometimes rather than refurbing an existing system, it's better just to replace the whole thing. And so that's where, um, you know, the development partners and the experts in water systems could help, um, you know, look at, you know, cost benefit analysis and what the options would be. And certainly so many communities, especially First Nations and Inuit communities are like, growing at such a tremendous rate, unlike the rest of the Canadian population. So our populations are growing and we need to expand our, our core infrastructure in order to accommodate new houses, new families, um, you know, the, the growth in our household so that, you know, we don't have to live in, you know, overcrowded housing. And so in order to do that, you need to really expand systems and the current, you know, infrastructure may just not enable that. And so it may require full replacement. And we're certainly open to it. We just look at sort of where are the revenue streams and what makes the most sense. And so we'll work with the community to, to meet what the community feels is their needs. And so we're not, um, 
you know, I think because, you know, especially on water and wastewater, and it's not to slight Indigenous Services Canada, but at, at the end of the day, there's a lot of, there are a lot of mechanisms of control features along the way with Indigenous Services grant funding in terms of making determinations as to um, the types of systems, the size of the systems, et cetera, et cetera, for the communities. And so um, we're not, you know, we'll work with Indigenous Services to figure out, you know, portions of grants and support for some of the feasibility studies, but we are pretty agnostic on the system. We do at our own expense hire lenders technical advisor to make sure that the asset that's being invested in and that we're loaning against can, you know, it has the right payback structure to pay back the debt and that the system will work. Um, so if it's new technology that's never been used in Canada or the world and a First Nations, the test case for it, it would be tricky for us to get involved um, because we'd want to make sure that the community is actually making a good investment and that we have confidence that the system's going to work. And that's where our lenders technical advisor would come in because they have the expertise in water and wastewater systems. We don't. We're just we're like a typical bank. So we don't have that level of expertise. And so we hire in um, some advisors to make sure that the system can function and meet the community's needs um, so that they can actually generate the revenue that they're they're um, making an effort to generate as well. Does that make does that kind of answer your question? Absolutely. And in very much roundabout way, you answered it all because, yeah, it, it's it's great to know what other nations have already done or needed to do so that it opens up a little more understanding. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You know, one of the things, you know, when I um when I think about sort of the Canada Infrastructure Bank and the opportunity we have is, you know, sure, we can help close the infrastructure gap. And I think that that's critically important. But the other piece that is also important to me personally is to start seeing more communities on that continuum of self-government and being on the continuum of self-government means, you know, all of you are, you know, in your capacity are, are doing really important work um, in helping your communities generate revenues and think around economic development. And that's a critical piece to self-government. So having own sources of revenue and, and being able to control sort of how and what type of assets you build in terms of your infrastructure is also you know, helping move down that continuum of self-government. And so it's, um, you know, it's something that's important to me personally. It's not, you know, in the bank's mandate by all, any means, but I think that that, what is in the bank's mandate is reconciliation. And, you know, it is at the forefront to me of self-government because, you know, when communities get to control their own destinies and make their own decisions based on what, what their needs are and what they determine their, their needs and their priorities are, you know, it really does help to move down that continuum of self-government. So it's uh, it's where I think the bank offers an alternative solution um, uh, to other types of, uh, of funding. I know we're at the end of time, so I'm gonna, I think we're at the end of time, or was it till, Breezy, was it till 5.45? You know, yeah and and there is a, like a, a little short break so we'd actually don't okay. get back into um the next for let's see till i guess i guess that's what your guys's time i'm in alberta so i have to think oh so yeah at not at 4 15 actually okay. we'll have um our next group so i mean you're you're doing just fine perfect i don't want to keep anyone from you know their coffee or <laughs> chat or mix and mingling with other folks so but I'm here and if anybody has any other questions I'm happy to take them thanks so much if not yeah that's thank okay you. we can we can close out then thank you so much Hillary and uh, thank you for coming on behalf of can do want to thank you so much and thanks everyone for participating. I know it ends up being kind of a long day on more on Zoom, but uh, hang in there and, and enjoy some of the other sessions as well. And don't forget to do your surveys. All right. Excellent. Thank okay. you very much, everyone, and have a wonderful uh, afternoon and evening. Thanks. You too. Bye for now. Bye. And it's understanding. Um, Indigenous Services Canada, Canada's uh, Community Opportunity Readiness Program um, will begin in about five minutes. Uh, my name is Paul Macedo with Can Do, Communications Director. Just so you know, you're in the right spot, in the right session, the right spot. So about five minutes to go, and then we'll do the uh, formal.
formal start. We're just a few minutes away from starting this session for those that are joining us. So there's a couple more minutes if you wanted to go get um, a refreshment before we start. Now's your chance. I see a few more people have joined us. Um, this session is understanding Indigenous services. Why do I say services all the time? Indigenous Service Canada's Community Opportunity Readiness Program and the process. Uh, my name is Paul Macedo, Communications Director with CanDo. So it's been, uh, if you've attended um, at least one Zoom session in your life, you probably know that uh, uh, to turn off your microphones unless uh, you're speaking, um, that way there's uh, reduced noise in the background. So please uh, mute your microphones if you haven't done so already. Um, also, these sessions are all being recorded and will be available through the Whova app for up to six months after the event. So uh, you can always go back and review. Uh, also, you can check out some of the sessions uh, that are happening concurrently to this one, um, because there's a lot of useful information, not just in this session, but other sessions, or so I'm told. I'll have to take that on advisement. Um, also, please, if you have any uh, questions, just direct them through the chat. There will be opportunities um, throughout the session for Q&A. Uh, but if you think of something, uh, put it in the chat and we'll make sure we'll, uh, we'll have um, one of our presenters um, address the, the questions you might have. Okay, so again, my name is Paul Macedo, Communications uh, Director with Can Do. I'm based in Edmonton, Treaty 6 territory. Um, I'm at home, uh, but that's where the Can Do office is. We're proud to be a partner in uh, presenting BC Links to Learning for the eighth year, first time virtual. Uh, it's always a first time for everything. And uh, we hope that um, 
the learning and the sharing and the networking will be uh, as uh, plentiful and as robust as it is in person. If not, we're really sorry, but this is the best alternative until uh, we can meet again in person. So today with us, uh, this session is uh, um, uh, presenting Indigenous Service Canada's. Um, oh my gosh, where's my, just lost my. Opportunity Readiness Program, Community Opportunity Readiness Program. And joining us today will be Don Potter and um, Aaron Hamilton. Don, you're up next. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, so my name is Don Potter. I'm, in, I'm an Economic Development Officer with Indigenous Services Canada. I've been an Economic Development Officer for the last four years. Um, I've been with Indigenous Services Canada for uh, about 17 years now. Um, and I'm speaking to you from Port Moody, um, which is in the unceded territory of Quiquetlam, Musqueam, Squamish, Stolo, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. So I, what I have today is I have a short presentation um, with some ISC information about the Community Opportunity Readiness Program. Um, after that presentation, uh, we can do a short period of time for questions. And then Aaron Hamilton of our, from uh, Subasset uh, has a presentation on his experiences with Indigenous Services Canada's Community Opportunity Readiness Program. So again, just a short presentation, then time for questions, then Aaron, and then time for questions as well. That's the agenda. So what is the Community Opportunity Readiness Program? Um, so the Community Opportunity Readiness Program provides project-based funding to support First Nation and Inuit communities in the pursuit of the participation in economic opportunities. Uh, CORP supports opportunities with the potential of generating incremental community economic benefits which includes employment, business revenues, and leasing revenues. So here's some eligible activities we have with the um, Community Opportunity Readiness Program. And within the Community Opportunity Readiness Program, there is two kind of streams. Uh, we have the regional process, which is for projects that are under $250,000. And we have the national process, which is for projects over $250,000. And generally speaking, the regional process is for projects that are um, for the planning stages and the development stage and the national process which is also called core pf is for projects that are in the acquisition or construction stage uh, so for the regional process in the notes here community-owned businesses uh, feasibility studies business plans and other related planning documents leading to the establishment acquisition or expansion of a community-owned business or for community economic infrastructure which is the planning and design for community economic infrastructure that supports multiple business opportunities. And these can be for multiple years, these projects. Um, and the national process, uh, so then going back to that community owned business is we call it equity gap. And then that is support for an establishment acquisition or expansion of community owned businesses. And there's also uh, for the national program, capital costs for economic infrastructure. So that will be site servicing, site development. Examples of those are roads, sewers, water connection, those sorts of uh, economic infrastructure works. So uh, typically what happens is when we have a project, we may see a project from beginning to end and it goes from the regional program to the national program. Um, so for economic infrastructure projects, First Nations may use the CORP regional program for feasibility and design work with the intent of receiving CORP national funding. And for equity gap projects, First Nations may use either the Corp Regional Program or an Aboriginal Financial Institute, AFI, for the feasibility and development costs with the intent of receiving Corp national funding. And here's a couple of things to note when you're working towards the national program. Um, we're gonna talk about this a little bit later, uh, but for the national program, all shovel ready requirements have to be met. Um, and all funding approved under the regional program is included as part of the maximum corp. So with, or the, the funding limit. So with economic infrastructure, that limit is $3 million. And for equi equity gap, that limit is $1 million. So if you have some money through the regional program that goes against those, um, those funding limits. And then the national program projects are submitted by all regions and selected for possible approval based on eligibility readiness. Uh, so that's just talking about the kind of the competition um, that we have 
for the national program. So here again is that opportunity. Uh, this is that uh, shovel ready checklist. So this is just for the economic infrastructure project. And this is not an exhaustive list. This is just the main points uh, of things that we're looking for. Um, obviously it's that sources of funding, confirmation of the sources of funding, um, whether or not there was a feasibility study for the project. Proof of land tenure, very important. Proof of land designation or land zoning, depending on if the project is on or off reserve. Um, environmental impact assessments, um, completed ISC environmental screen decision. Anchor tenants, so anchor tenants, when we're speaking of those, we're talking about economic infrastructure. Um, when we have multiple businesses, we wanna make sure that there is an anchor tenant, um, one, businesses, one business that, that there already is an agreement in place. Um, copies of required regulatory approvals copies of service agreements, and that can be water agreements, that sort of thing, um, construction permits, um, tendering package in place, including staff engineering issued uh, for construction drawings, uh, class A and B cost estimates and construction schedule. One thing that I, I typically say is, if we have a project and we're looking for like what makes a shovel ready project uh, or make a project shovel ready, is if we had approval today, could we go to tender next week? Do we have everything in place that we're, we're not now going to back to doing some development work? We actually have that all in place and we can go to tender next week. So this is the um, shovel ready checklist for the acquisition for the equity gap projects. Um, so uh, confirmation of all other sources of project funding, including a commercial loan for minimum 40% of project financing. So that is actually a requirement that there needs to be um, that commercial loan from a bank for a minimum of the 40%. Um, the, if it's a limited partnership, that partnership has to have an ownership of 51% from the nation. Um, completed business uh, certified business valuations for acquisitions and financial statements for the last three years for expansions. Um, feasibility and business plans and market and uh, sensitivity analysis. And that was just again for those equity gap um, acquisition or startup projects. So this was our schedule this year. It's a little different this year. Um, we actually only sent our um, call for applications for the regional program in January, um, but we gave a little bit of time there. We had the due dates in uh, March. Um, and then that uh, screen for those projects has actually already been completed. Um, if additional core project or budgets become available, um, remaining projects that we have in that list, um, we will go down to the next one um, for consideration for funding. And for the national program, um, a call of applications was sent out uh, November 9th with a due date for December 4th, and that has been uh, fully allocated at this point. Again, like I was saying before, um, uh, CORP is a competitive program. So the first bullet there talks about the regional program uh, for this year. We received 42 applications requesting 4.8 million against our 2.1. And this was actually a slower year. Uh, typically we're receiving 60 uh, plus projects. I think that a lot of nations weren't really ready for um, project-based funding with economic development this year. Um, for the national program, we had 24 applications nationally. Um, that were considered shovel ready requesting over 30 million against a 22. That's a little bit skewed as well because that already passed the shovel ready requirement. So there was actually uh, many, many more projects that came in and some were screened out as being not shovel ready. Um, so again, as I was speaking before, um, you can also go to AFIs for specific business projects. Um, and this is this, just the definition of uh, the AFI definition from the NACA website is AFIs provide development lending, business financial and support services to First Nation, Métis and Inuit businesses in all provinces and territories. Support includes business loans, non-repayable contributions, financial and management consulting, and business startup and aftercare services. AFIs are a great resource. Um, they are the four main AFIs in BC, including Talhout, uh, Aboriginal Capital Corporation, uh, All Nations Trust Company, Nichalmuth, and Tricorp. Um, and then that's, I just put the home base there. Um, the, the borders are a little bit loose. Um, so if, if you already know who your, your AFI is, um, obviously that's the AFI that you deal with. If you, if you don't know, um, just uh, go with your best guesses to that home base. Um, and if that's not the, the um, the AFI that, uh, that you will deal with, then they will let you know who the one, the one is. 
So for ISC's economic development, here's our contacts. Uh, the Director of Lands and Economic Development is David Russell. Uh, Julia, who is on the call here, is the Acting Manager. Um, and then we have the three economic development officers, including myself. I work with the South Coast and North Coast. Uh, we have Vanessa, who works with Thompson, Okanagan, Mainland and Southwest regions. And we have Josh there, who's in outer space, working in the Caribou, Kootenai, Northwest, East and Kachu, the Chaco regions. Um, obviously, if you have any information or you want any infor more information, you can contact any one of us. Um, but there's also a general um, contact email at the bottom there. I would just let people have a chance to record that if they want to. That's a bit of a mouthful or a handful there. Um, if not, um, I do believe that this um, presentation is also um, going to be on the, um, the website for L2L. Um, is there any questions? I'm just, I was thinking just a short question period for this and then we'll let uh, Aaron do his presentation and uh, we'll have his, pres his questions and uh, general questions as well after that. I'm just going to look in the chat here to see if there were any. All right, it doesn't look like there's a lot of questions at this point and that's fine. I will uh, turn the presentation over to Aaron. Thank you, Don. Um, greetings, everybody. My name is Aaron Hamilton. I'm from Hupetchesit First Nation in Port Alberni. Um, but I, I'm the operations manager for Tsubasit out in Lake Couch and uh, Territory. I've spent the last 20 years of my professional life working with First Nations and, and, and management and uh, have spent the last 11 years uh, with, with Sue Bossett. So I'm going to share my screen here and go over a presentation that I did for our marina project that we did through the CORP program. So it's titled The Creation of Katza and Marina. So we, we, we engaged our community going back, way back to 2011 to, to sort of um, undertake this big uh, development. And I'll, I'll speak to some of the other development that we have going on too as we go through this, but it, it'll all crystallize as it's, it, this marina becomes a, a major focal point. So the steps taken were community engagement, which was critical, uh, planning, which incorporated comprehensive community development planning, habitat assessment planning, and as well as a marina feasibility. And we did two of those just to, one was more of a commercialized uh, enterprise and the other one was more refined. Financial analysis, master planning for the whole area, sourcing out funds as Don just highlighted with some of the AFIs, et cetera, construction, and then marketing and lease registrations. Uh, and, and I'll speak a little bit more on that side because that's how we're funding it as well as expansion, which we've already talked about uh, tripling the size. So the, the first, first with any major project, the, the, the critical component that you need to do is community engagement. So it originated in 2011 and we began our, our comprehensive community development plan process. Uh, it spanned over a year and a half and it, it involved very many uh, sort of desktop exercises like this with a lot of blown up maps and just really engaging all all ages of our community. This one was more youth centric, but it, it inc incorporated our elders, um, our staff, and, and like I said, our, our youth as well. We also did brainstorming sessions on site. So what we did is we brought leadership and we brought others right down to the waterfront area, uh, which was bar somewhat barren land at the time and very uh, treed with maple and, and alder trees and it's very hard to visualize but it actually got people to, to discuss sort of what what was going to happen down there uh, additionally we we also do an update sort of every year and we're actually getting ready to do a five-year uh, multi-year planning cycle right now but we check in with our community at least every year on this specific project uh, that, that's on top of the the monthly newsletters the quarterly reports um, etc and then the other thing that we did is we also looked at our regional stakeholders. So the, the neighboring jurisdiction, the town of Lake Couch and 
the regional district, Couch and Valley Regional District, um, our neighbors, so on either side of us that uh, are non-First Nation neighbors, as well as Mosaic, um, which is made up of Island Timberlands and Timber West as they own the, the lake bottom. Um, with all three of those, with three of those, besides our neighbors, we already had pre-existing um, mutual benefit agreements and, and relationship documents with each one. So it became very easy to start discussing um, what we wanted to do. So here, here's a here's a good visual on the top there. You can see sort of how how treed the area was. That was after we we cut away a lot of the blackberries and then sort of started opening it up. And when you get to the end, you'll you'll be probably pretty shocked what it looks like now. But uh, the comprehensive community development planning was critical um, to really engage our community and, and and identify what it is that they want to do on their lands. We we, we did it very much um, community driven and then we ran with it. So it wasn't what Aaron wanted to do on the lands or any of our develop, developers, it was what does the community want? And as I mentioned, that took about two two years it laid out the areas of development that we were able to, the go and no go zones is what I call it. So it really crystallized sort of where the development areas would be. And it involved extensive community consultation, as I mentioned before, even bringing them on, out on site and, and being engaged all the way through. We also did land use planning, which incorporated our traditional use study, which I didn't have on here, which wasn't too uh, too robust in the area. Um, we also did a habitat assessment to see what kind of um, aquatic and, 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 uh, and animal species that were around. And then encompassing all this was sort of our concurrently happening was our, our land code um, vote and, and we became a land code operational nation in 2017, which sort of crystallized and encompassed all this stuff into one, one overarching document. And then as I mentioned before, we had our initial study for marina feasibility in 2017. Uh, we updated that to become more of a um, more of a uh, domestic as opposed to commercial marina um, enterprise. The other thing that we did, was, which was critical for us to move forward, was a financial analysis. So we did a performer financial review with our economist that we brought on staff or brought on as a consultant, and and his numbers helped determine whether it would be feasible. And this is where I said it was initially for a commercial marina, but we didn't, the, the biggest challenge we had is we didn't have turning radiuses to allow for a boat launch on site. So, so as we were doing the feasibility study, we, we started figuring out that we had to, we had to detract from that and, and, and sort of massage it enough to still be allowed to have a marina, but we couldn't do it as planned because of the turning radiuses. So we built it into our res residential development. And as you can see here, there's a, there's a snippet from our, our community, development plan that sort of has where this was in the timeline. And I was actually quite shocked. Sometimes I get too caught up on things, but it actually fit in really nicely uh, that we're ahead of, ahead of the schedule there. Um, here, here's some visuals of, of some of how tied into all the master planning. So, so when I say master plan, we had a whole waterfront development plan on how we're gonna incorporate everything. And it actually became a very, it's been very exhaustive and, and actually very crazily busy down there. It's been a, a, a pretty big hub for the area. So tying into the CCDP, the major development zone is that first graphic you see there. We, we sort of color coded it and figured out what, what areas were developable, what do we want to put there? And then that, that sort of, that was all vetted through the community. So we got full support on that. And I would say all, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but Basically that everything that's colored has all been developed now in the last three years. Um, that CD, CCDP also laid out critical timelines and, and helped keep my feet to the, to the floor to make sure that, you know, we're aggressively going after funding. We're, we're looking at partners, we're getting the right people on staff, finding the right consultants and vetting out those that are, those are be good and not good for the nation. We also referenced other regional plans. So this is where the, the critical partnerships with um, the town and the regional district, looking at their OCPs, making sure that we, we can dovetail into other, other projects that they have and looking at concurring interests. So one of the things that we did, and we've actually been successful with two Corp uh, national programs, we actually ran our, the, the, the water and sewer services about 1.8 kilometers from, from one edge of the reserve to the other um, five years ago in preparation for 
this type of development that's happening now. Um, then we also looked at communal use. So one of the critical things at our, at our waterfront, and you'll see when doing this, this marina, and I know every nation feels this way with economic development, is to ensure that our nation always has their, their community, has their ongoing interest at heart. So, you know, we're not, we're not taking over the whole, the whole community and the whole reserve base to, to sort of make economic development as, a, as number one priority. It is the number one priority, but it's also allowing that mixed development to occur. And we've still been able to retain portions of it to ensure that we have um, long-term access specifically for our nation and for our members. Uh, it also allows for complementary use though. So that's the, we, we have a communal beach down there where you know, we're, 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 we're gonna ensure there's separation, but there's, it's gonna be so subtle that you wouldn't even know it. Um, and we, wanna, we sort of wanna harmonize and have everyone enjoying the land base um, that's down there. And we also looked at inclusion of waterfront residential development. So this is where it's become critical. Um, it's become, it has become critical and it's the major economic driver. So that's North Shore Estates. We have, uh, we've just recently sold 25 lots um, in a subdivision that's right next door to our, our, our minor lots on, on the, we had four lots down there. We've done 25 and now we're looking at doing another 60 and then another 60 following that. So it's actually, getting pretty crazy with the housing market that, that we're able to capture this kind of market. Um, some of the pictures on here, we did a waterfront walkway. Um, that's what you see on that middle picture. That walkway was built for, for safety reasons and spans the whole 1.8 kilometer stretch. And now is, is becoming a, 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 a sort of catalyst for the, the municipality to con continue that on for another three kilometers and then tie into a new, um, they're doing a new, a new, um, what do you call it there? <laughs> a new weir, a new weir and dam structure that they're gonna continue on that walkway all the way across and connect the whole North shore of the lake. So this was done about two and a half years ago and, and, and just sort of, you know, we're trying to pave the way to start showing what a, what a, what a, 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 a new community can look like and, and, and make sure we have all the building blocks in there. On, on below, we've, we've actually started doing some, some installments of our, our First Nations art and, and sort of putting our stamp on things at our waterfront and, and, then, and then educating people as well on who we are, our hereditary based leadership structure, um, how we've originated, where we've come and where we wanna go. So we've always kept that close to heart and we have a mini longhouse on the bottom right as well. Those are all functions that are built into this waterfront development that, that will stay intact. So sourcing out funds. Uh, one of the critical things that we've done over the years is, you know, for the first probably eight years, seven, eight years, we ran a very tight ship with the nation and it was very hard. You know, a lot of our nations, like I said, doing this for over 20 years, you know, we, we, there's always a need, but we had to, we had to, we had to really hunk, hunker down and, and save up money because we knew that we wanted to invest in, into our development. Um, it's not super, it's not a big, large amount, but it was enough for where when you need to contribute to projects it actually carried a lot of weight. We also found a partner, um, with another local developer in town that was doing an, about 38, um, uh, tiny homes and, and he needed a, the marina space. So we were able to receive a letter of agreement from him that he would purchase the, uh, the additional slips. We looked at our AFIs, so I've I've reached out to Talahout um, and NEDC, and there's there's we've got some some minor funds that are going to enhance the marina and removing our um, Katza Adventures as a as a kayak stand up paddleboard and canoe rental business. We're moving that onto the marina, so we'll already have our first sort of um, tenant on their marina as well. And then with Corp, so talk to our economic development officer. I've been in talks with Don for over the last two years. Um, we worked, worked together with, with, with ISK and our engineers and our team to really, really hunker down to figure out that we had the shovel ready criteria that was required. Um, it was a lot of work. I'm not gonna pretend that it wasn't. It was a lot of, um, we had to ensure that we had the 10 year in place from the province for what under the water sustainability act, we had to get mosaic on board to agree that they'd, they'd allow us to, to put this permanent structure on their lake bottom. 
Uh, we had to engage the, the, the local municipality, engage our residents, um, but we did it all and we submitted the application and got approved. Uh, we, we went with a local company, uh, Jornick Marine, based out of Lake Cowichan, has done a lot of work on over the coast. Um, and we confirmed the design and the design, the, the, the build started off site, but it was just up the lake from us. And the first picture you can see some of the fingers and some of the moorage that was getting built off site and then they throw it in the water and then they, they towed it down. Uh, the other picture here can show sort of the, 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 the rectangular shape of it in the water. And then the middle one has the gangway um, leading down. And then uh, there's the power driver on the bottom left. And then on the bottom right is sort of the complete project right now. Um, so, so the other thing that was critical to this was the hydrology testing to make sure that it could withstand, you know, and thank, we're very thankful we're on a lake. We don't have, we do get winds every day, but we're not on the open coast, but it was still critical to do hydrology to make sure that we, they, it remains stable. So here's a rendering. So marketing and lease registrations. Um, this is identification of potential purchasers. So North Shore Estates phase one and two, that is all this stuff up above here on the first visual. So you can see the marina planned into the master plan. Um, there is another little viewing platform that's off to the right. That marina is gonna join that um, in the future. And our future developments sort of span in the back here. Um, I mentioned that earlier, we did 25 lots and then we're, we're looking at another 100 plus lots over the next two to three years. And as I said earlier, change in scope due to site challenges. So now it's predominantly an anchor for our residential development. It wasn't initially gonna be that, but that's sort of the way it shifted with those turning radiuses. We just didn't have the, the boat launching capabilities. Excuse me, and then expansion. So a further 28 births as per our corp application that we, we, we said we we're gonna do 56. We have 28 there now. There was a delay, shockingly, due to COVID. Some of our material, um, this, this board here, it's, it's, a, it's a type of material that com comes from China. Uh, we've been on delay for six months, I guess. Uh, but we're on track now that this will be complete this summer and we'll have the additional 28. We'll still meet the timelines of our overall uh, proposal. And then we'll also be doing an additional 28 bursts based upon the uptick from our further phases in North Shore Estates. And I, as I highlighted just earlier, the connectivity to the waterfront walkway, we'll see another probably 28 move down. And this, is to, this allows for cohesive completion and connection to other community infrastructure. And that's all. Um, any questions? And I'll try and get back here to quit sharing my screen. Just while I'm waiting for questions, I just want to, you know, one of the key things was was having ISC support all the way through. Um, I know it can be a challenge working with government, and I, I know there's, you know, a lot of our nations sometimes have a challenge doing that, but Really, really, really good people I've worked with in ISC all the way through economic development, any program really. And just really, you know, if you can be, if you can have all your planning done beforehand, that's the critical component. If you have planning done and your community has spoken, you know, try your hardest not to let politics get involved, but just keep going with the plan because it's, it's such a cool feeling to, to see our youth even. Right now I get to see our youth that get to be part of that plan and their eyes get big when they can see it become complete. It's, it's actually coming true. Um, I didn't say this at the beginning, our nation is only 28 members total on and off reserve. Um, and I, I, I highlight that because we had a lot of challenges when I first started here that, that your, number, your number of um, people somehow dictated what you can get done. We've had fun over this last huh, 12 years, really had fun flipping that on its side and saying, we can do it regardless of size. It doesn't matter. Um, it's, all about, it's all about the vision that you have. And, and you know, our late uh, hereditary chief is probably smiling down. So thank you. Oh, I see one down there. Um, Hi, Aaron. Yes. Hi, Aaron. It's Gail Joe call, calling. It's Gail Joe here. Well, hey, Gail. How are you doing? 
Good, how are you? Um, not really a question, I just wanted to comment um, how wonderful it is to hear an update of what you've done and your team have done. And I actually wanted to make that comment of how small the band is. So when you consider it as a pro rata basis compared to other bands, you guys have done amazing stuff. And I just, well, hats off to you, Aaron, and your hard work and the team that you have there. Um, just loved your presentation because of the new pictures that I was able to see, because I think I visited you probably two years ago. Yeah, it's been too long. We need to. Yeah, we need to very long. Um, but just the photos that you've done, uh, the development is just, um, I, I see it as just very complimentary to the municipality that is just right adjacent to you. So great work, Aaron. Thank you. We'll connect offline, Gail. Yeah, you bet. Uh, so I'm just receive Roy's question here regarding mutual benefit agreements. Um, we we had we had more of an agreement. We have a with Mosaic. We're actually just getting ready to re, re, redraft one. Um, you know, it's it's as simple as picking up the phone, and then you know, if you have someone good on your team that you trust with negotiations, it, it's not you know, in, in my view anyway, over the years, it's not too challenging really, um, as long as you know what you're trying to get at at the end game. Uh, and regarding funding, can you stack your funding to lower your contribution amount? That's a Don or a Vanessa question. Or so, so, yeah, either either one of us, I, I can I can try to answer it, and they can weigh in if they want. Um, but yes, um, you can stack as long as that um, limited partnership. That's really the main thing about the advantages or the, or the um, who owns who owns the business at the end of the day. Um, but if you're getting other contributions, yes, you can stack. And then that also increases uh, the ranking of the project as well. Um, if you are lowering your request um, in relation to the, the total project cost. Yeah, just the, the contribution from the applicant, there is a minimum that Corp requires, but the rest of them, as Don said, if you have partners, it actually um, helps bump your project up a bit. Any other questions? If not, um, I know in this day and age, it's, it's all digital and, and online. Feel free to reach out if you look up. I know it's too bossy, but we're like Couch and First Nation. That's what you can look up on the on Google. I am an open book. I want to see every nation succeed. I, I don't hold any secrets. There's no secret formula that we try and keep crafted in the back here. Um, you know, the more nations that can start... Uh, you know, I made a comment the other day that um, we, me and my wife love to travel throughout BC and I, I, I long for the time when we can drive through, you know, I used to, I used to comment that nations used to get the, the, how do I word this play, sort of the crappy lands near road, near, near, near all this industrial area. Well, it's, it's, it's nice to see that we can start finally maximizing this, this, these lands and now it's come full circle. Our lands now are one of the more higher, higher sought after lands that, you know, when I first started here 12 years ago, we're, we're sort of like, wow, how are you going to get services out there? And once you do all that, it, it starts really crystallizing. So I'm, I'm super happy to see nations on the island, people that become nations that become land code operational and start getting some of that jurisdiction in their own, uh, in their own nations and can make their own decisions and still be accountable to the law and to other standards, but can make their own decisions. It's, it's been fantastic to watch and really trying to build a networking, um, you know, hopefully once this pandemic's over, really, really trying to network with other nations and help. That's the biggest thing. We want, we want to help everybody. So thank you everybody that, that came out to attend virtually. I really, really appreciate it. And like I said, if the, the call is there, I, I always try and return a call within a day and I'm more than willing to help anywhere I can. Yeah, thanks a lot, Aaron. That was a great presentation. Great to see what uh, the nation's doing or has done. Thank you, everyone.
So if there's no more questions, I guess we're going to um, end day one right here. Um, that was very inspirational, Aaron. Um, that's, you know, it's uh, be, what we do is, uh, can do is we look at positive stories happening across the country and we try to share that and kind of inspire. It's, it's not a cookie cutter approach, but, but the inspiration is there. And, um, and uh, I'm inspired by what, uh, what you've accomplished, what you're accomplishing there. And uh, I think that uh, a number of uh, other communities across the country, um, you know, uh, could be inspired as well. It's phenomenal. Like the 28, <laughs> the 28 member base is uh, pretty significant because there's so many communities with hundreds of members saying that they don't have enough people to to make uh, to realize some of the dreams and some of their infrastructure goals. And certainly, um, you know, your community with 28 off and on reserve um, can can certainly point the way forward. Uh, that that's not always the case. That it, that that number isn't the critical factor. There's other critical factors. Um, so I will I will stop rambling. Um, there's some kudos in the chat for you, Aaron, as well. Um, and um, I thank you, Don, for your presentation, Aaron, uh, again, and all of you for taking the time to um, to join us this afternoon. Please remember that uh, we have another full day of sessions. Uh, hopefully. Um, that will inspire you as much as Aaron's did for me on a personal level. So uh, thank you all for joining us. We'll see you again uh, tomorrow, uh, hopefully, and uh, take care. Have a great afternoon.